There are over 17,500 museums within the United States, welcoming over 850 million visitors each year. Did you ever wonder what goes on behind the scenes in museums, creating the displays and exhibits we all enjoy? Join us as we explore museums and their exhibits from the inside out. Hi, I'm Leslie Mueller. Welcome to Museum Access, the show that takes you behind the scenes at America's top museums. Today we're at Chicago's Field Museum for a special exhibition called China's First Emperor and His Terracotta Warriors, organized with the Emperor Qin Shi Huang Terracotta Army Museum in the People's Republic of China, among others. 2,000 years ago, China's first emperor brought many changes to China. He constructed the first Great Wall, built roads throughout the vast territories to increase trade, and even created a standardized form of Chinese script. He was obsessed with immortality, and he began construction of a palace for his afterlife. For 30 years, legions of workers produced an estimated 8,000 terracotta figures to be buried around his tomb, guarding him for all of eternity. In 1974, a farmer was digging a well when he uncovered some of the life-size figures. It was to become one of the world's greatest archaeological discoveries. Today, we'll get a behind-the-scenes peek at how these precious pieces of history were carefully installed here at the museum, and we'll learn more about their 2,000-year journey. So are you ready for an incredible adventure exploring China's rich culture? Let's go. For those of you who may have missed our first visit, let's learn more about the Field Museum. This space is gorgeous. It really is truly phenomenal. Well, tell me, what, what, what can people expect to see when they come to the Field Museum? Well, at the Field Museum, we're all about looking to the past to understand the future. And um, we have incredible exhibition spaces that tell the story of life on Earth for our visitors. And at the same time, we have a world-class collection of over 30 million specimen and artifacts. What else can we expect to see here? Well, at any given time, we have an incredible array of permanent exhibitions. We have our Evolving Planet exhibition which looks at the history of life on Earth. It also takes us through the various mass extinctions that have affected our planet over time which is really incredible. You get the opportunity to look at other incredible creatures similar to Sue and the Tyrannosaurus Rex and, and really what that evolution of life on Earth has been. We also have our um, really wonderful collection of dioramas. Um, wow. I remember that, those as a kid. Those are so exciting. Yeah. Yes, they're incredible works of art, and yes. we most recently um, actually renovated uh, our hyena diorama, and the artists that we have on staff that really go in and doing this painstaking work to build out the display to give a really um, realistic look at what it's like for those animals um, is really incredible. We have our hall of botany that gives you a look at various plants from all around the world. Um, really just a wide array, whatever interests you might have, whether it's very science focused or anthropological, there's really something for everyone here. That's great. And gems, I, I know that there's gem collections yes, we and have halls of jade of gems, and all sorts of, uh, yes. for those of us that like our little baubles. Yes, the hall <laughs> of gems um, and also an incredible jade collection. Um, and we have some really rare meteorite specimen that are actually on display also. Which oh, is, that's great. Yes, so the Field Museum has the largest private um, collection of meteorites in the world and our guests are able to come and see these really really rare meteorites in the building. So Jacqueline where are we now? We're at the Cyrus Tang Hall of China which is actually the Field Museum's new permanent exhibition um, and what's incredible about this space is that our team actually went back into our own collection of more than 33,000 artifacts and they pulled about 350 of them that take a look at the rich cultural history of China over the course of 5,000 years so we all know China as, as a powerful um, and complex country today but this really takes us back through 5,000 years of their history. Oh, what a great exhibition, and it's going to be here forever. It is going to be here for good news, quite a while. Good yes. news for everyone. Yes, and it's uh, a great one to be able to come in and really see what we pull from our own collections that really make the Field Museum one of a kind. Cyrus Tang immigrated to the United States from China in 1950. Through hard work and perseverance, 
he became a successful businessman and founded or acquired over 100 companies. Mr. Tang founded the Cyrus Chung Ying Tang Foundation to promote greater understanding and mutual respect between the United States and China. The extraordinary Hall of China exhibition helps millions understand the great sweep of history influencing modern China. The exhibition explores China's origins, its traditions, and its people's resilience over the centuries. Many of us think of China as monolithic, a gigantic singular entity defined by one land, one people, and one culture. But China is composed of diverse landscapes, ethnicities, and social status. Since ancient times, China has traded goods and exchanged ideas with other countries despite changing political boundaries and the rise and fall of ruling dynasties. During expansive periods, maritime trade routes and the Silk Road brought Chinese goods, people, ideas, and innovations to the world, and conversely, brought the world's goods, people's ideas, and innovations to China. Spirit stones are extravagantly shaped rocks that often come from Lake Tai in Suzhou, China. In traditional Chinese gardens, the stones may represent mountains and inspire visions of idealized landscapes. Now that we understand the strong ties between the Field Museum and China, let's explore China's first emperor and his terracotta warriors. As you enter this special exhibition, there is a cool stone armor suit on display. In the time of the first emperor, soldiers wore lacquered leather armor similar to this stone suit. Archaeologists discovered the remains of 87 suits of armor. Scholars estimate that each suit would have taken about 400 hours to make. The stone armor may have been an offering or perhaps was intended to equip the emperor's soldiers in the afterlife. I can tell you I would not want to wear this for all of eternity. Tom, thank you so much for joining us My today. My pleasure to have you. This is an incredible exhibition. You have to tell me, did this start many years ago in the planning? Yeah, we first approached China about seven years ago about okay. borrowing some terracotta figures for an exhibition on the first emperor. Uh, and it, it took a little while in the negotiations. Their first response was, yes, we'd love to work with you, but it'll be a couple of years yet. So we went back to them about three years later, and they said, yes, how about in three years? <laughs> so still like it. The negotiation yeah. <laughs> has been uh, kind of long, um, but we're really happy to have the, the 10 terracotta figures as well as 163 other objects from well, the breadth of this exhibition is like nothing I've seen. Yeah, we really wanted to give our visitors a, a flavor of not only just the terracotta figures, which are amazing in themselves, but also a lot of the backstory behind the first emperor and how important he was for Chinese history. Let's talk about him a little bit. He was he was a young man when he came into more limited power, but tell me about his background. Sure, yeah. He came out of a period in Chinese history called the Warring States period. China had never really been unified up until this point. There were some, some larger dynasties in China, but really China, like we think of as a unified country, didn't happen until after he became the emperor. So, so they were all warring at they, that yeah, point? Yeah, there oh. were. There were seven different warring states, uh, and he basically, through warfare, took over each of them ultimately becoming a unified country under his rule and the Qin dynasty. And how old was he when he first came on board? In the well, he was born in 259 okay. BC. Uh, he became king at the age of 13. Oh my uh, and then emperor at the age of 39. Okay. So uh, he was very young when he became king, obviously, yes. uh, and, and then emperor. Um, but he had a lot of really great advisors that helped him uh, in terms of kind of unifying China. And some of the things that he did at that very early stage in Chinese history are even still being used today. Is that like the script and currency? Was yeah. that some of what? Yeah. Well, if you think about seven different warring states, they all had their own form of coinage and currency. Yeah. Uh, people wrote in different ways. Uh, people had different units of, of weights and measures and things like that. So a lot of the things he did in unifying China um, had to do with these little kind of bureaucratic things sure. that helped him rule such a vast territory. 
So by the time he's now emperor, and there have been, from what I understand, some uh, some attempts to kill him, mm -hmm. he becomes more obsessed with immortality. And what starts this process of how many years did it take to build all of these warriors to protect him in the afterlife? Well, like I said, he, he became king at the age of 13, mm -hmm. and, and they, they guess that they probably started building his tomb uh, at that point in time. So, you know, he lived wow. for, he <laughs> That's lived for another 36 yeah. years, but, okay. but it was something that he wanted to start doing, was to start building a tomb for himself. Um, obviously, he didn't think he would die so young, yeah. um, but, uh, you know, they started building it. And, and, and the, the, the tomb uh, complex itself, so mm -hmm. his burial tomb, and then all of these pits that surround it, uh, have about a square footage of about 22 square miles. So we're talking about a huge wow. yeah. area that's devoted to his tomb. And this idea of being buried in, and, and then having all of this goods and things with you in the afterlife was something that was very common in Chinese culture. Uh, but he took this idea to really an extreme in terms of creating a, a, a complex that had uh, over 8,000 warriors to protect him. Life size, life. right? Yeah, actually a little bit larger than life size. Larger? Yeah. Well, well, let's backtrack a little bit. How was, how were these pits discovered? Well, the tomb itself, which is a 250 foot tall mound, uh, was actually known. It, it, it was passed, you know, through history. People knew sure. that it was yeah. the emperor's tomb. However, all of these pits of the terracotta warriors and the bronze birds and the musicians and everything, those kind of fell out of knowledge. Uh, and in fact, uh, the first pit of the terracotta warriors was actually discovered in 1974 by a farmer who happened to be digging a well uh, and came across a terracotta head. So really, <laughs> completely by accident. And if you look at a map of that pit, he was digging in the very corner of it. Really? The yeah. outer corner? Yeah, the very outer corner. So, you know, if oh, he the were there, yeah. he would have missed it. Yeah, there goes the biggest archaeological right. discovery, or of one the, of, of them. The 20th century, of the 20th century. Of the 20th century. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, it really was. Well, I'm dying to get into the exhibit so we sure. can start seeing some of these terracotta warriors. Sure. How about we do that? Absolutely. Thanks, Tom. Sure. This model shows one of the palaces where the emperor lived and administered state affairs. From the upper balcony, he could look out over the Wei River and his capital city of Qianyang. So the process of producing all of these figures Walk me through that. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it, 30 it's years, a, right? It's a huge <laughs> yeah. labor force, yeah. uh, really, to, to create these terracotta figures. Um, and actually, this concept of mass production is something that he really started to use in full force. Uh, and it first started with creating this empire. So the empire needed infrastructure. It needed things like sewage tiles. It needed oh, yeah. uh, to be able to create roads and everything like sure. that. So, so he conscripts all this labor into helping him build his empire. Okay. Then when it kind of transfers over into starting to create some of the terracotta figures for his tomb, then, you know, these, these factories that are making drainage tiles are now making torsos. Oh, interesting. Uh, and, and I, with molds? Yeah, or, with molds. Oh, okay. yeah, right. All so right. everything is molded. All the, the, the bodies and the legs are all molded. It's when you get to the heads that you get this really great uh, kind of uh, individuality. I mean, so these are not portraits of individual people, but they're meant to represent individuals in his kingdom, in a sense. So I different see. facial types uh, is something that you see when you look at all the different heads that we've got. These here. banners are incredible. Yeah. yeah, and these are actual terracotta figures from the site. Um, so we want to be able to show our visitors the great diversity in some of these faces. Each warrior has a unique face and hairstyle due to different molds and details added by hand post-construction. In addition to beards and mustaches, workers also shaped a variety of hairstyles on the figures, including braids, French rolls, and buns. But the process itself is really, you know, so it's such a time-consuming thing to create these figures in terracotta. They have to be fired at an extremely high oh, temperature. They're fired, that's right. Yeah, they're oh. fired. Um, and then they're decorated. And I think that's something that most of our visitors don't know is that these terracotta figures, they're kind of clay-looking to us right. now. But they were quite 
don't want to say garishly painted, but they bright were really colors, bright colors. Yeah. Reds and greens and purples. In an um, oil-based paint? No, it couldn't have been. No, it was a, a no, water-based water -based paint that yeah, would deteriorate would actually off. go over a, a lacquer. So oh. the terracotta hmm. itself was fired and then lacquer was applied to it and then the paint went over that. Um, so yeah, they were quite brightly colored and we have a couple of replicas in the exhibition that show you what they would have looked like. So even that's a laborious process to do right. the lacquering. So yeah. once they get the figure yeah. done, that's half the battle, so yeah. to speak. Wow. The workers painted the terracotta figures using a wide range of pigments. Most were well known at the time but the bright Han purple was unique to China. Knowledge of how to make the paint was lost around the third century AD, and scientists only rediscovered its chemical composition in 1983. And was everything in the pits terracotta? No, uh, and in fact, so they estimate that there are about 600 different pits that surround the main tomb oh. complex, right? So four of them are devoted to terracotta figures, okay. whether it's warriors or archers or whatever. And um, jugglers, right? And any, acrobats. Anybody that yeah. would have been yeah. in acrobats, his life. Yeah. civil officials, <laughs> uh, and all sorts of things like that. Um, but there were also other materials as well, things like bronzes. There's a pit of the bronze chariots, of which we have two really spectacular oh, replicas. These are stunning. Here. Yeah. yeah. And then there's also bronze birds. Uh, there was a, a chamber that had 46 bronze birds, geese, and ducks, and everything, which were fantastic. Um, there were also bronze dings, these feasting vessels that yeah, were Yeah, what are those dings? Well. They're all different sizes, right? Yeah. yeah, we have a really huge one here that we uh, were able to borrow. It's a spectacular ding. Um, and it would have been a feasting vessel, so there would have been all sorts of food inside of it. Made of bronze? Yeah. Oh, that must weigh a ton. Yeah, yeah, it really was. I think it's about 450 pounds. China's first emperor and his terracotta warriors exhibition was carefully packed and flown cargo air from Shanghai to Chicago. A conservator from the People's Republic of China accompanied the exhibition during its long journey. Of course, checking each piece for any damage after arrival at the Field Museum is an important part of the process. It's an all-hands-on-deck effort by the exhibition department team to carefully uncrate the priceless pieces and place them in their final position. One and a half years of planning included the exact position of each object in the gallery and all of the exhibition graphics. By the way, a field museum representative will accompany the collection back to the People's Republic of China when this special exhibition ends. So here we are in what is the highlight of the exhibition, the actual terracotta warriors. But I see one guy that's really big. Tell me about him. Yeah, he's the, a figure called the general. Um, so interestingly enough, they've only discovered nine of these figures uh, at the site. Hmm. And you know, while there are you know, 8,000 charioteers and uh, archers and cavalrymen, only nine generals, so he's really special. Um, and he's actually slightly taller than life size. He's about six foot two. And back then, your average Chinese person would have been about five foot six. Wow, so, so he'd be intimidating. Yeah, right. so he's pretty impressive. <laughs> That's the idea. And, yeah. and the idea, actually, the idea was that to create this kind of idealized army.
side, right? So, you know, to, to see a terracotta figure coming towards you at five foot six, maybe not so impressive. Yeah, exactly. Six foot two is pretty impressive. That would do it, that yeah. would do it. Yeah, and in fact, uh, another interesting story about the general is that we think that he was originally here back in 1980 when the Field Museum had its very first exhibition of terracotta figures. We were actually the second museum in the United States to be able to bring terracotta figures over from China. How exciting. Only six years after they had been discovered. So well, which is why you've got this relationship that they allowed you to bring it back again. Sure, sure. And yeah. th this is incredible. Tell me about the other warriors that are here. Sure. Well, we were able to get 10 figures total, which is Unfortunately, all that the Chinese government allows out yeah, at one so you time. So, that. yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but we're really happy with the ten figures that we were able to get. We we got a great diversity and range. So we have two archers. We have a kneeling archer and a standing archer. We have a charioteer. We have a cavalryman, an infantryman. Uh, we have someone who's called a stable boy. He's a little figure about this tall. Oh. Uh, and then a civil official. Um, so not all of the figures that were found at the site were actually warriors. Identified as a civil official, this figure was likely crafted with his hands clasped under his long sleeves to signify that he was not a manual worker. On his hip, he carries a knife and sharpener, which would have been used to erase mistakes written on wood and bamboo strips. So, you know, he, he had to create this empire to rule over in the afterlife, and he needed bureaucrats, he needed civil officials, he needed acrobats to entertain yeah, entertainers. in the afterlife. Yeah, yeah. Right. so we actually have a, an acrobat figure here in, uh, on display as well, and then a, a life-size horse as well. Uh, so it's a pretty great group of 10 figures. It's a very complete, have. yeah, it it's is. a very complete yeah. set. And let's go back to these pits again. <laughs> um, I'm trying to figure out, some of them are still in place. Most of them are still in place, correct? Oh, yeah. In People's Republic of China. Mm -hmm. Now, how do they get them out of there? I mean, they're staying in place, but there are certain pieces that are allowed to leave the site? Well, they estimate that there are 8,000 terracotta figures at the site itself. Uh, they have actually only excavated a, a quarter of those. Oh my goodness. Only 2,000 of them. And then they put back together approximately 1,000, maybe 1,100 figures that they put back together. So you have to understand that all of the terracotta figures at the site were damaged. The roofs collapsed under oh. the weight of the earth, and so everything was damaged. I couldn't figure out, pieces. yeah, because you look at the pictures of the pits and yeah. they look like, oh, you just dusted them yeah. off, and that's how no, they found no. them. It's a huge, not only archaeological uh, expedition yeah. and effort to, to uncover all of these things, but then to put them back together slowly, piece by piece, is something that took, you know, over the last 40 years. And if you go to China, you can walk around above. There's like a mezzanine area sure. that yeah. you can yeah, see there's like them. a catwalk up around. So you can see partial uh, reconstruction of what pit one would have looked like. Uh, and there's excavation ongoing at the site as well. So you get to see those workers uh, working down Unbelievable. in the pits. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Now, how many of us are actually going to get there? <laughs> Probably not too many. So right. if, if they can't get there, yeah. coming to the Field Museum yeah. is this the is, thing this to is do, a rare right? opportunity, I would think, for, for Very a lot rare. of our visitors to, to see these things up close. Plus, if you were to go to China, you would never get this close. Here you are standing, you know, three feet from a kneeling archer, when if you were at the set, you'd be 100 feet away from Oh, yeah, it's it like easily. seeing the Mona Lisa yeah. or something. You're way far away yeah. from it. Well, Tom, yeah. thank you so much it's for taking pleasure, your time Leslie. today and okay. sharing your knowledge of the Terracotta Warriors. My pleasure. The Terracotta Warriors were tasked to hold watch over China's first emperor for all of eternity. What fun to see them up close and to learn about Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi's desire to reign over the universe, not only in his lifetime, but in the afterlife. His obsession with immortality resulted in a monumental achievement that has become one of the world's greatest archaeological discoveries, his eternal army. So there you have it, the journey of China's first emperor into the afterlife. Thanks for joining us on Museum Access. I'm Leslie Mueller. See you next time.